Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Bishop. I'm one of the uh, incubation board members of Catalyst 2030, among other things. And I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this discussion of Build Back India Together. Um, briefly, we have an excellent set of speakers um, who are from the Catalyst 2030 community, which has come together over the past couple of years uh, to really work together as social entrepreneurs around the world um, to figure out how to achieve a bigger impact on driving the sustainable development goals. Um, and obviously, as the COVID crisis has gripped the world and increasingly India, um, that has become one of the key focal areas of a great deal of positive action by Catalyst 2030 members and other social entrepreneurs. Um, and we're going to hear a lot about that today. Um, the Indian community of social entrepreneurs is a particularly active one um, amongst the broader Catalyst 2030 community. And uh, so I'm very excited to be able to um, explore with them today what lessons they're learning, what their ambitions are, um, and uh, the great work that they are doing at this very, very difficult time. Um, to set the context, we have two initial speakers, and I'm going to hand over first, straight away to, um, to Neelam. But uh, before I do that, I would just say that we will be taking questions from uh, you all uh, during the event, but we would like you to put the questions into the chat function, at least for the first hour or so of the uh, discussion, um, so that maybe after each speaker, as we go along, I will pick one question and, and uh, just uh, answer that, ask that quickly, but then uh, we'll have a time for conversation and more questions towards the end of the session. Anyway, Neelam, would you like to kick us off? Hi. Welcome all, and thank you so much for making the time to be here with us today. Uh, I just want to apologize for a slight technical glitch at my end. I ran out of Wi-Fi, so I'm actually parked under a street light, so I may not have the best lighting. Uh, hoping to catch a good signal on my phone. Uh, apologies for that. And I just want to start off by saying that it's a great honor for me to kickstart this session, to share the wonderful, wonderful work that's been happening in India. It's a time of great sorrow and pain for all of us, not just for India, but I would say all over the world. Uh, but in, within all this, there has been some wonderful co-creation and collaboration and a lot of the social entrepreneurs and activists and people working on the ground have come together to put together a unique bunch of sol solutions. Uh, it's my honor to represent Catalyst 2030 India and the National Association of Social Entrepreneurs. And just very briefly, just give you a kind of a vignette of the kind of hectic activity that has been happening here. Uh, I'll start off by talking about the fact that people just came together. Some of our, my great colleagues, uh, of course, I have to start with Anshu and Minakshi at Goonj who have had the foresight to have a disaster response initiative long, long back, long, long ago. And they, they've just jumped into the fray and there's been phenomenal work at that end. You'll be hearing from them. Then of course, we have a very large North Indian coalition in very, very difficult parts of North India, RCRC. Mr. Ved Arya will be sharing more about that. There is Shiv of Catalyst uh, of uh, COVID Action Collaboration set up a year ago, uh, who's really, really done some seminal work in shaping the fund flow and the kinds of packages that are really needed by rural India. He will talk more about it. Then of course, I must jump into uh, introducing Ashraf, one of the younger social entrepreneurs and the unique work he's doing with so many of the younger uh, entities on having more youth involvement in social change and how they are responding to COVID. Right? I'm going to make the mistake. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to forget a few people because I'm doing this extempore. Uh, there is of course Deval Dasra, uh, who has been around for all us Indian social entrepreneurs over the last 20 years, encouraging us, helping us, training us on how to respond in situations like this. Um, the, uh, there is Kolev. Uh, that I will speak about later. Now, friends, if I have missed someone, please call it out right now. I think I have. Neelam uh, Ashwin, 
Titli? Of course, Ashwin, my hero. Yes, so I watched Ashwin and his team uh, on uh, the Catalyst 2013 NACE network, really jump in and overnight, literally, it took them about two weeks, I think, uh, they set out this wonderful uh, telehealth solution. Uh, uh, Shalab and he will present. And uh, how could I have moved Ashwin to the last position? But that's because I'm a little afraid about not having my uh, tech in shape. So that's it. It was my job to introduce all this wonderful work to you all and really talk about how we could all further work and how we could make this huge state of distress a situation of great opportunity for us to build new solutions and new ways of working, not only for India, but for other parts of Asia and other parts of the globe. Because one can see this problem moving around and being around for years to come it also helps us being able to tackle the SDGs in a far better way. Uh, and I have to call out uh, Catalyst 2030 here again. I think all of us in many ways are a product of Catalyst 2030. Last year, we launched Creative Dignity. I was working under the apprenticeship under Jeru and having learned how Catalyst 2030 emerged, I was able to launch Creative Dignity which has also been doing stellar work through this period. Thank you all once again, and I'll hand it over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Nilam, and just straight over to, uh, to Sunesh. Uh, do you have a, a few words for us? Thanks, Matthew. And just, just adding to what Nilam, Nilam said, I think three things stand out for me if, if I look at the last couple of weeks or, or three weeks of frantic activity, as Nilam said. One is um, massive collaboration. I think every, each one of us recognizes that the problem is bigger than each of us individually. So coming together was, was obviously um, very natural. Two um, uh, systems, strengthening system change. I think every innovation comes with, with that and social entrepreneurs are very used to it and their uh, usual uh, way of life is, is far more important than, than you know, now than ever before. And, uh, and third is um, scale. And I think um, while coming together was, was natural, um, looking at scalable solutions was also um, a, you know, imperative at this point. So these three things stand out for me uh, you know, across these initiatives. Thank you. Over to you, Matt. Thank you so much. I think those three, the, those three words, collaboration, systems change, and scale are really the drivers of why we came together as a Catalyst 2030 community and um, we're now going to go into seven uh, case studies of uh, various co-led initiatives coming out of the Catalyst 2030 social entrepreneur community in India. Um, each of them is going to last for about five minutes um, and we'll have as I say one question from me which will either be from me or from uh, someone who's put it in the chat um, our chat box um, and then we will have about 20 minutes Q&A at the end. Um, and our first uh, case study is, is, is Shayla is going to be talking about tightly. Shayla, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure to uh, present this initiative called Titili. It's the Hindi of butterfly. And this name was chosen to reflect uh, rural populace, you know, the how they interact. Uh, 20 days back, uh, seven of us, seven different organizations who were working in different spaces in health uh, decided that we should come together. Ashwin was the architect. And we decided that we will not bring a technology heavy solution right now, but make sure that uh, you know, the person in the rural, in the remote area of India can use a phone, a simple uh, stupid phone and call a doctor and, you know, this WhatsApp university messages, you know, the fear, the anxiety that COVID has created, and it's only spiraling. Uh, you know, we, we are able to provide some succor in terms of, you know, giving the right information and lowering the anxiety down. So in the last 20 days, uh, seven of us have come together to set this up. Uh, and the idea is that this, this is primarily aimed at reducing anxiety, uh, reducing vaccine hesitancy 
and answering questions where people are not even ready to come out of their house, even if they have fever. So, you know, uh, wanting them to use technology was uh, altogether a different question. We just took a very simple route and set this up. So this is a toll-free number. Uh, can you go on the next slide, please? So uh, primarily what we have seen in rural areas, uh, the uh, primary care centers, the hospitals have been extremely overwhelmed. Uh, there is a paucity of current, correct information. There is a lot of vaccine hesitancy. There is a lot of hesitancy in identifying yourself you know, as COVID positive, as if there is some stigma around it. And people are choosing to stay at home rather than talking to someone outside. So we thought that you know, creating this uh, kind of uh, telehealth system will uh, you know, provide this uh, outway for these communities who can talk to a doctor in their own language. So we set this up uh, using a set of volunteers and volunteer doctors. We have about eight languages and 11 states covered today. Uh, there is no app. Uh, there is no Wi-Fi that we are talking about here. Uh, and we were able to onboard 34 frontline callers, as well as 13 doctors in the last 15 days. The, our partner organizations, the seven of them who are mentioned here on the screen, uh, each of them has taken up a role and responsibility in this helpline. Uh, someone is onboarding the volunteers, one is training them, the other is creating SOPs and protocols, and the other one is actually you know, amplifying, the, amplifying this helpline. So just 20 days of work uh, that we have set this up. We are uh, planning to scale it up further. Next slide, please. So we are uh, planning to scale this up in the second phase. Uh, we have started with basic health advisory and we'll be adding uh, you know, mental health and post-COVID care as we go forward. The plan is to uh, have about 60,000 calls per month. This will be inclusive of inbound and outbound calls. So we also have calls coming where uh, you know, people are talking to the doctors and the doctors are calling back the people. So uh, we have ground volunteers who are enabling this on the ground where they uh, you know, help the person in the village to talk to a doctor. And if there is a second consultation or a referral, the doctor calls them back. So the idea is that we uh, reach to about 60,000 calls a month. That is about 700,000 calls a year. And uh, we are right now in the you know, mode to join in, amplify this telehealth network further. So that's it from our side. Great. Well, you're obviously moving at tremendous uh, speed and doing this. And I wonder if you just tell us, you know, what is the um, what is the biggest challenge you face in scaling this up, and how how fast could you scale it if you could overcome that challenge? Uh, the biggest uh, challenge, Matthew, is that you know uh, people need to really talk to a doctor. They really need somebody with that medical background to talk to them. We don't have enough doctors right now. We do not have enough resources to uh, you know have uh, streamlined doctors who can call them back because you know people are not just going to take the phone and call a doctor like that from rural areas this is a more uh, urban phenomena so creating that trust amplifying that trust uh, is one of the greatest challenges that we have and also you know keeping in pace with the protocols that are developing each state is developing its own uh, medical protocol so making sure that we are able to so you know we have been meeting every day uh, for the past 20 days seven of us so uh, it has been quite something. And I think uh, as we scale forward, two things, one, more partners and uh, more doctors. And uh, if, is, there a place, uh, is there a place to spread the word about doctors? If, if doctors want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, simply you know, write to me or Ashwin and uh, we will onboard them. There is a full onboarding process for doctors and volunteers. That's all. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to move straight on to um, the villages matter, uh, and Anshu Gupta is going to talk to us about that. Anshu. Hi. Good evening. Uh, so I think it's been like a journey of now over two decades, and uh, for the last two decades, we are just talking about villages. Uh, and I think this particular uh, disaster has proved that how we really ignored the villages of India, which has uh, seventy percent of the population. And to be honest, when people say that slums are the extension of the city, we often tell them that, no, that's a wrong statement, because if slums are the extension of the cities, people like me and you should go and stay there. Uh, 
बिकॉज वी इग्नोर दिलेजेस तो स्लम्स बिकम द एक्सटेंशन ऑफ द विलेजेस you know I mean, that's how this entire population operates and the most unfortunate part and what we saw that how millions and millions of people actually started walking and in the last uh, 15 months uh, how they have actually walked uh, wise can i see the presentation also here uh, you know i can yeah so uh, so that is what we are saying that uh, in this particular pandemic also ultimately huge amount of reverse migration happened uh, to the places from where people ultimately came and they have now actually uh, gone back uh, to the places where already you have certain kind of distress so so farmers are absolutely absolutely you know forced to sell it in much lesser prices uh, in the in the villages that kind of income is not there and they they came here to the cities in search of a job and now they are pushed back to the villages and unfortunately when i talk about the agencies i always talk about the government agencies the private agencies the corporate sector and large part of the funding agencies and all uh, villages have never been a focus uh, in india it is absolutely sad to see that the people who have been growing food for us remained hungry and the people who have been making houses for us i mean they come here as labor uh, they remained homeless next Uh, so some of the key areas what we thought that a we will talk about hunger so from the day one because last year when the disaster happened the entire focus was on migrant till the time they were visible this year the entire focus remained on oxygen ventilator and all kind of things what we didn't understand in the process that uh, because of lockdown and because it is a top you know it is a top up disaster it's not a disaster in isolation uh, the hunger crisis actually actually gone uh, really really bad we also need to understand that ventilator remdesivir and all are very important for people like us whole lot of people like us but the fact also remain that for 99% affected people uh, even paracetamol is a life saving drug for for whole lot of us and then ultimately as i say dal chawal which is the basic lentils and rice is the biggest oxygen for a uh, large number of people then we created something called missed out communities which is the people who are already neglected marginalized who are further pushed back by one level these are the people who in any case you know whole lot of us work and now we can imagine when the common citizen come in the marginalized uh, group the originally marginalized people with disabilities sex worker transgender people with leprosy are actually gone much deeper and and the attention is uh, not there next so in the last two decades uh, we have been able to create a grid i mean as as the telecom sector laid uh, optical fiber and using it for multiple purposes we have also been able to create this entire grid of relationships of of know how of the local need of the logistics and the same grid same pipelines can be used for for any kind of relief work for any kind of development work Uh, and it is a very trusted relationship with these uh, large scale uh, multiple stakeholder which is created in the last two decades and that is the reason that the moment a disaster happened we were able to respond immediately because we didn't have to look for the new partners new logistics issues new areas next uh in the last say about 15 months it's almost about 10 million kgs of uh, ration and other essentials in the villages uh the medical intervention is a new one this is just uh, just the work in the last one one and a half month it is still going on we have a strong uh, collective uh, we call it sanja collective which is 550 plus grassroots institutions in 27 states and uh, this is just just a small uh, glimpse of what we are trying to do but uh, we are very sure that we have to go back to the basics and we have to work with the last mile healthcare giver because now the entire covid management in the smaller places in india is in the hands of healthcare workers or the last uh, health related work who does not have even access to couple of thermometers and we are we are thinking that that person will actually take care of the covid so that's how that's how this entire intervention is uh, made and with such a beautiful uh, network we do want that this entire sanja collective uh, people should make use of it because there is a there is an established grid so if you are working on i care if you are working on education if you are working on health there is there is an ecosystem there is something which is already developed but yes for sure uh, we are uh, looking for more people to join this and my last point is that you know one thing which we have been able to do in the last few uh, years and disaster is one of the biggest problem in that disaster takes away dignity of people 
uh, and and the entire model becomes a very charitable model uh, to the people who have otherwise very dignified life. So we we replace this entire charity with dignity. So even for the for the relief kits which go to people, people contribute. People make roads, dig well, clean 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 ponds, or make bamboo bridges, and then with lot of respect they receive the material. So so this entire material also works like a currency. and the giving becomes uh, dignified thus the whole model which we are looking at a few million uh, people we will certainly uh, reach out in uh, due course on hunger health and especially the marginalized community and we we call them missed out ones i'll stop here and i'm open for questions yeah so a couple of quick questions relating to your last slide thank you for that the great presentation one is what what is the conversation you want the media to be having at the moment you say it's a neglected area So so Matthew the villages are completely ignored you know you can imagine that the farmers in this country who have been able to find out 6000 different variety of rice okay it is not done in the labs they are unfortunately still called unskilled so how do we really change this narrative how do we how do we make sure that the pandemic has given us an option that we look back and and kill the mosquito instead of treating malaria i mean it's okay to work in the slums but we need to answer this question that why do why do the slums really happen why are people forced to leave the villages when they can actually survive and live a much more dignified life in much lesser resources but we are not ready to put resources there how many of us actually work on agriculture or farm or water for farm you know that those narratives need to build and that is why these convers these conversations are very important for all of us to build and then you listed a series of needs But as you think about the next month or two, what is your number one biggest challenge? Uh, I think more conversation on again. I'm saying rural India because if you see the entire international aid which is coming to India right now, it is largely focused on on oxygen and ventilators and and concentrators and all that. Right. But what I'm saying is that how many of our villages are equipped with uh, you know even required number of paracetamols or oximeters oximeters was oximeter was something alien for me also till last year but now it is a need so how do we go back to those basics instead of again working on just machines and and ignoring the needles i think that's that's what we need that people focus on these very very important issue simple example matthew very simple one of these ignored community we work with the people with leprosy and when we were doing a consultation one of the fact which came up is that more people died or suffered last year not just because of food but but because they didn't have access to a cotton bandage because every 3 days you need to change that bandage because we are not thinking of those small issues which are actually larger issues and which ultimately forces or or you know convert these people into permanent disability and and a simple need is a cotton bandage is not is not a big plant or something so how do we really take care of the needles So thank you very much. That's a very important point, uh, Anshu. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to RCRC Rapid Rural Community Response and uh, Ved Arya. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Jeru, and uh, thank you everyone here for making the time to come and uh, listen to us. And already we have heard about the health uh, solution. Also, Anshu talked about hunger and rural India. i want to say that who are we to begin with we are people i would like to say that we know by children we are the people who are into constructive work rachnatmak karya so and we are also the children of people like dr kurian so we have come together those who are uh, working in organizations like pradhan or sijan aga khan rural support program and fes so we came together last year and we started with this number 7 that typically talked about and we are now close to 70 in La and we thought we should not waste a crisis and we should actually get uh, together often ngos are blamed for not coming together and uh, so you know i want to say that beyond collaboration there is another thing we are leaders of organizations we need organization leaders but we also need leaders who are beyond organizations only when we get uh, leaders who think beyond their organizations can these collaborations happen can then only rcrc kind of collaborative can happen so that is the second thing i want to say and uh, 
another thing i want to say is that often we are we come together because of external threat covid is one thing but also civil society is going through a huge amount of external uh, over regulatory reach of the government that also brings us together and that's why i would advocate today at, or at any other forum also collaborative of the collaboratives is very critical and that's why i like to be here and i want to thank everybody who has brought us together so may i now uh, have the access to the uh, screen yeah i am saying that this is a relief rehabilitation and resilience uh, i am talking about livelihood resilience but uh, i am sure we will get more time to do that today i will talk more about relief as matthew you asked what are the immediate challenges for this month next month or the month after so i think we are not live uh, health organizations but we want to mitigate the impact of second wave on rural india and one issue we will find reverberating through various various presentations is that government is not really uh, sort of come up to expectations so how we can supplement government's effort why is it critical today is very critical to know that there are these needs of hardware but what about the software we can get the oximeter there but we don't know how that person can use the oximeter and record and report back that this person has uh, you know symptoms which are mild that means oxygen levels are above 94 and these people have below 90 that means we have to refer and take them to the hospital that's why we need there are situations that we have 10 lakh asha so there are ashas everywhere but we also have many many situations where we don't have ashas somebody has to write a book where there is no asha because that's what they wrote one book was written by david warner where there is no doctor today we need a situation a solution to the situation where there is no asha so next slide please uh we are uh, today almost close to 70 organizations we are uh, across the north india ganga yamuna and the saraswati and narmada these are the and brahmaputra if you want to look at uh, tapti these are the rivers around which many of the communities live and that's where our organizations have worked for last 30 40 50 years we are in 15 states and we have together actually been mobilizing large amount of money from the government uh, but not so much from the government the money that we get from the government is directly for the community but this budget we are talking about is from various donors and we have a this employees we talk about we have 10000 and more people who are these these are self help group leaders all of them are women and they are the ones who are the uh, the support that the community seeks from and we are serving close to 16 million people next please this is last year we uh, i've just shown one slide we reached almost half a million people like that receiving food packets but we are not only doing relief work we are highlighting through our research what is the situation on the ground and we wrote this paper uh, in the hindustan times and we highlighted the issue of migrants but also how so many people had cut down food and didn't have cash to even buy food and medicine so we are pushing media to publish the situation in the rural india as well so the middle class of india gets to notice what is happening happening here and right now also we are in the middle of a survey called death count survey we will then reveal soon only deaths are not happening only in delhi and bombay but also happening in rural india as well because we are listening to stories of four to five deaths or up to 10 deaths per village even in the state like gujarat next please so what is the problem we are trying to solve inadequate facilities in the government hospital it is very well known only 6% of sub centers and 12% of phcs meet the public health standard on the other hand if you look at ashas are overworked they are going without any protective gear they don't have face shield they don't have masks and they are being asked to go and look at the symptoms and without oximeters also can you believe it and how will we get any state government will get 
this assessment of what is the symptom, what is the extent of the disease. I can tell you it's happening in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, UP. They have policies where there are no oximeters being given to ASHA. So our solutions are threefold. Supplement the government. Several district collectors have called us and said, can you give us, sir, some oximeters? Can you give us some oxygen concentrators? Can you give us masks? What a state of the country it is. I'm really surprised and shocked to hear district collectors pleading with us to provide this support. We want to first do, second point is that when the battlefield you see soldiers are dying, we must actually provide support to patients. Then we want to go for vaccine. And third is, because we are present in, the ten, in more than 10,000 villages and we have the community resource persons in the form of women, that is the experience we want to use to respond to the crisis. Great. Well, thank you very much for that presentation and for the work you're doing. What, what for you is the biggest barrier to achieving even more impact than you're having at the moment? I think uh, on the one hand, we have the support of the government uh, in several, several districts. But what we are not seeing, Matthew, is that that district level uh, support that people want and we are providing support, that is not culminating at the state level, nor it is culminating at the center level. Of course, center is sending advisories to every state, citing RCRC presentation, but it does not really come together and say, okay, let's recognize this effort and either provide resources or provide recognition and let's come together. Niti Aog meetings are not going to be enough. So I think we are looking for, even among these people who are here, can we come together and, and ask the PM that not just give us some nice words, but recognize and reduce the FCRA restrictions. That is what will be one message to me to, to, the, to the public here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we're going to move on now to the COVID Action Collaborative and Shiv Kumar. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Going after Ved Arya is uh, always uh, not just a pleasure, but also uh, wonderful to hear what RCSC is doing with. Uh, you are an inspiration to all of us and uh, happy to present right after you. Uh, can I have the slides, please? <laughs> Next slide. Um, yeah, I'm not going to sit and convince uh, the choir here uh, why we should come together, right? The COVID impact is going to be deep, it's going to be wide, and it's going to be long-term. Uh, when I prepared this slide one year ago, uh, you know, most people said, prepare for one year. You know, all of this is done and dusted in a year, right? Now we are looking at uh, two years and I, I was even then fairly clear that this is not going to be a short term impact. And if you're just looking at uh, it beginning as a medical uh, challenge, now it's a full blown humanitarian challenge. And therefore coming together is not an option. Melting of boundary is required between organizations. We have a duty to do that, but even more importantly is to open our hearts and work with each other. I think, uh, you know, the uh, beautiful, one of the speakers earlier said, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting who it is, that, you know, you need to go beyond your organization uh, and that is true leadership at this point in time. Next slide, please. So as we uh, looked at what is it that we can do, uh, the Catalyst Group, which uh, set up this collaborative initially, uh, we are not a member-driven collaborative in that sense, uh, the way RCRC is set up. We are more uh, a bunch of organizations who existed previously for 25 years, and we had relationships with multiple organizations, and we said, we got to do something, let's come together. So in this collaborative, we put the people in center. Uh, as you know, we still in India have a very virus-centric uh, reaction, not a people-centered response, and that's what this collaborative is about. And we do three things within that, calibrated services, essentially training, technical support and financing to ground level partners so that they can reach the maximum number of vulnerable communities with services that are very, very critical to them. Today, it may be food, tomorrow it may be transport, day after tomorrow it may be a SIM card, it could be a hearing aid for our elderly population, whatever is required, our communities require and our partners demand, that's what we try to ensure that they get. So this is where uh, we are trying to reach 10 million people and the power of the numbers come in there. The second really is about the power of the network. Uh, we set up a solution exchange where we believe any network should be self-sufficient. Any network should be able to leverage 
each other's uh, strengths, not only look outside, but also look inside for support. So we have till now, uh, you know, facilitated around 300 odd solutions between our partners, which have led to specific outcomes, whether they get support for designing uh, IEC package, or if they get a support for scaling up their program, or they find partnerships in which they could do something together, which will reduce their costs. There have been several such examples. And third is really uh, leveraging the uh, innovation. India is a hub of innovation. Uh, we have, you know, Jugaad Technologies is spoken about, but I think at every level, there is potential to solve problems. And I truly believe COVID is an incredible opportunity to solve problems. And that's where we created this thing called Impact Canvas, where we took some of the most complex and wicked problems which COVID has thrown at us. And I'm going to give you one example, the plastic, uh, the plastic, we call it the pandemic plastic. We had a plastic issue uh, in terms of safe disposal from hospitals even back much before COVID. But post COVID, we have a much bigger challenge, right? It's COVID infected. It, uh, you know, it's handling is incredibly important uh, to save lives, but at the same time, it can also kill and it, it can also damage the environment. So we put together a team of people to look at this problem from all angles. Again, keeping people at the center, whether it's the medical professionals or also the people handling the waste, how do we collect it? How do we safely dispose it? How do we not damage the environment was the ask. And this group has come up with a solution which we are now uh, scaling up. And the second example is uh, bringing in technologies uh, and applying them. Early warning system using sewage system, sewage testing is something we pioneered uh, in India, not pioneered in a sense that we were the first ones to do it. We were the first ones to do it across the city. Today, Bangalore city, as we sit here where I am, uh, is able to tell out of the sewage what is the level of COVID which is there. And uh, it's less important now as the infection comes down, if there is going to be a third wave, we will be able to give the government a 15-day advance notice about a ward, which then can lead to micro-containment zones. So essentially, through the collaborative, we are aiming three things. One is resilient and thriving vulnerable communities. They just don't need to just survive. They need to thrive during this period. And institutions which work with them. Today, they are also vulnerable as much as the people itself. So helping them being efficient and effective and also uh, survive during this period. And thirdly, build a dynamic humanitarian response ecosystem. We have not been so forward looking like Goonj, which already thought about a humanitarian emergency, but our experience of working in tsunami, Latour and other earthquakes, we have brought those lessons here in terms of how do we do it. But next time there is going to be an emergency, which there will be, whether it's a one health led emergency or a climate emergency, we want to ensure that this collaborative is not spending time coming together and is able to quickly respond like the way Goons did. Next, please. So the people that we focus on are around 13 different uh, categories of them. These are all the kinds of vulnerable communities our partners are working with. We know they are disproportionately affected and would be. But what is important is the issues are magnified, particularly inequity, injustice, and the insecurity that these communities are facing. We recently added transport workers into this group. <clears throat> and some of the groups that I'm talking about are very, very large. And you may wonder, what are we doing with small farmers and migrants, which can go up to one third of the population of this country or more. But it's not that we are reaching all of them. These are the groups that our, our uh, partners are working with. Next, please. So uh, within CAC, there are three types of partners uh, and there are implementers, which are NGOs, CBOs. Some of the government agencies are also part of our collaborative. To them, we deliver three kinds of value. There are also a huge number of providers, 100 of them, who provide human resources, materials, finance, technology. Uh, and these, uh, they, these are providers that we connect with the implementers and sometimes they themselves do certain activities. And there are enablers, policy, academia, uh, industry associations who are part of it. The private uh, healthcare network in Karnataka is part of our other thing, St. John's Institute, George Institute. These are uh, you know, enablers who come in, who are able to collect evidence or help us in a way that what our partners are doing can be amplified much better. Next, please. So uh, where are we at the moment? Uh, given around 323 partners, we are in 712 of the 741 districts of India. That means a pan-India presence. We have till now reached around 3 million of the special communities that I was talking to you about. We have managed to raise around $62 million worth of money, transfer it from the hands of the government <coughs> to the communities that we work with. And typically in India, these are called the social protection schemes, or for some of you, it's called the citizenry rights. 
And essentially there are 1,300 such uh, schemes and programs in India and around 300 of them only focused on COVID. And these schemes are at a national level and each state has its own schemes, sometimes simply mirroring the national uh, schemes. So what we did is while we were trying to raise funds for our partners, we didn't want to wait. It is important to get money across or economic benefits across to the communities that we work with. And that's something very, very quickly we have managed to do. This figure may look very large to you, but when you spread it across 3 million, it's a very small amount. And I think we need to continue doing more of this. And our target is to uh, you know, be four times the amount that you're seeing on the screen, which is $62 million. The second area of our work in terms of financing is to help shape and mobilize monies for our partners. Uh, and I will give you the difference between uh, you know, uh, uh, shaping and mobilizing. Uh, in the case of mobilizing, many of you know, it's about raising funds and applying it. And our uh, entire philosophy in this collaborative is that there is no middleman. There is no uh, overheads to be charged. Whatever money is raised, we prefer it goes directly to the partners. And if at all it has to go through us, we find a way to maximize what reaches our partners. And we have managed to raise around 10 million such uh, money through direct uh, you know, reach outs to foundations, CSRs and other parties. Another 17 odd million, what we have done is what we call a shaping. Uh, when Global Fund uh, you know, uh, was approached, in fact, our communities and our organizations mobilized themselves to write a letter to the Global Fund of uh, HTB and malaria. And we did a campaign which led to $10 million being raised for sex workers, uh, gay men and uh, transgender community which was a big victory and we played a big role as collaborative within that. And that's what we call a shaping. And we need to continue doing that because we believe there's a lot of money, at least three to $4 billion, which is to be shaped. And by shaping our idea is not to us, but to the communities and people who work with these communities. Next, please. Yeah, so who's behind this collaborative? We're, we're fairly short on time. So if you did quickly share through these. Sure, we have a, a, a whole range of luminaries in our uh, governance panel who guide us on this. And next, please. How can you work with us? Uh, you know, uh, become a member if you're in India or you want to work in India. We have five investment groups, which are uh, syndicated funding, which is we have high impact packages, which reach millions of people on vaccination and telecare. Uh, we have specific initiatives, like 11 of them, which are related to health uh, and livelihoods. And we have specific communities that you may want to invest in or specific geographies, or you may pick a specific partner for whatever reason you have. So these are some of the areas that uh, you could engage with us other than being a partner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shiv. And just one, one quick question. I mean, you, you talked about wanting to quadruple the amount of money. Is, is, is that your number one you know, opportunity at the moment? Is it fundamentally about financial resources or is there something else that you're wrestling with even more urgently? Um, the number one priority right now, Matthew, is vaccinating our communities as many as possible very, very quickly. And secondly, providing telecare to all the 10 million that we are working with. And, uh, you know, you, you saw Shailesh's presentation, Shailab's presentation, and he's working with us on the rural and we are happy to contribute there. But in the urban areas also we are working. So these two are our number one priorities while we parallelly work on the social protection. Fantastic. Okay, well, great. We're going to move on now to, to Neelam again uh, with the COVID Livelihoods Coalition. Neelam. Hi, friends. Happy to be back. Uh, yeah, I'd love for the presentation to come up because I'm not going to take too much time over it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Yeah. So, Colev has come up over the last uh, month, I would say. Uh, purely because uh, we work in the area of value addition. These are very, I think the key number here you need to see is the 126 million people out of work after the first wave, right? So we really need to move to the next slide, please. Yeah. So essentially, uh, when we launched CoLiv, uh, it's the full form is COVID Livelihoods Coalition. We called up Shiv, I mean, we called up Shiv's partner, Raghu, at Vritti, whom we worked with for many years. They work in the farm sector. Then I also spoke with Ved and Nareen of Pradhan and really looked at the entire possibility of how do we add more value to existing uh, uh, collaboratives. And through the work at Creative Dignity, we'd seen 
that it is really, and Raghu explained this to us, it is really, really critical that the amount of poverty that communities are going to get driven into, to pull them out of it, it's not going to be enough that they continue with their normal routine activities like farming or fishing or any of the normal trades they uh, are part of, but they transition into um, uh, value addition, right? So industry has a huge history of working with women's collectives where a lot of value addition is created for global supply chains like IKEA, et cetera. Farm and off-farm occupations, as you can see, and that's our focus, other than farm and off-farm, we focus on uh, uh, oceans and uh, forest communities within the commons. And uh, when we will go back into economic construction, I think what is going to be very critical is, is this economic construction going to be built on principles of yesterday or the future? Next slide, please. And which is why this whole discussion and focus on the next regenerative economy, right? Because with farmers and uh, off-farm occupations, which are basically value addition occupations, they could be artisanal, they could be any other form. What is critical is that um, you accrue and move them beyond local economies into larger global economies. So currently, Colive, so, uh, so Colive was formed under this premise that it could really play a larger role in livelihoods. But yes, it would have to be tiered in uh, an immediate response. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, Totally, I was doing an article which uh, Shiv has, has co-written with me, so has Ashwin. We also obviously wanted Vedji to be there with us, but it's awfully tied up, which was completely understandable. But we did a quick math around that. And frankly, all the coalitions that you have met and who have spoken so far, all the organizations, including the Catalyst 2030 NACE network, in which Ashwin has worked very hard doing some data jamborees and onboarded another very large bunch of organizations there, the total reach is about 150 million people, right? Which is about 20% of the most vulnerable populations we're talking about. The numbers on the districts are of course not ours, co-libs, but across, that's the kind of reach if we all put our arms out together, that what is what we have. Next slide, please. Yeah, so Colive today has got uh, a bunch of uh, 75 partners, which are across these sectors. Next slide, please. Yeah, so immediately we are going ahead with the emergency response. Yeah, uh, having learned from our peers uh, with the 75 fresh organizations who are part of us. And further, we are talking about reducing vulnerability uh, through uh, by actioning something called the National COVID Care Corps or the NCC Corps. So uh, it's, it's, uh, this is a brand name which has been very purposefully taken to sort of clone something that we have in India called the National Cadet Corps. But we've just called it the National COVID Care Corps. The whole idea being that this is going to be about every 10th citizen or every 20th citizen playing a far more active role. And that was ex exactly what NCC was envisioned as in its days. So here, uh, and of course, in the long term, in the targeted economic recovery, we have a very, very strong economic uh, recovery and livelihoods plan, which we are shaping with a lot of help from Shiv of Catalyst Management Services, who's just gone before me. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now here, of course, we are talking about the ration kits and the COVID protection. Next slide, please. Now, this is a slide which I'll just stay on for a little bit of time. I would have loved for Bharat to speak more about it. Bharat is, uh, is, is the founder of Dakshas, uh, who is, uh, he said, Neelam, it's one slide, I don't want to jump in, but so I'll try and do justice to the phenomenal amount of work that Bharat, along with Pratham, along with uh, NSDC's Health Sector Skill Council, JSS, Noura Health, ECHO also, all of, them, all of us have come together within CoLive 
to co-create out a program that we are calling NCC course. And th this will have two cadres, advanced and basic. And this is about building the frontline and strengthening the frontline workers at village level. It's, it's got, uh, the advanced is based on our already trained public health practitioner, but really equipping them with COVID response. And the, the next basic is very much focused on community workers. And it's the phenomenal hard work of the members like Bharat, Pratham, Noora, JSS, that this program is really seeing uh, the light of day and should be initiated around June 15th with both the cadres. Yeah. Next, please. And we're sort of almost out of time, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's it on the economic recovery piece. Uh, we have a very strong plan around capital capacity and channel. And uh, we'll share more about that. We're uh, really looking at working very closely with UNDP on this. We've just jumped off a call with them along with CMS. Next slide, please. Yes, I mean, I should say uh, CAC. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So we are also aiming really high and really seeing at the scale and size of the problem that uh, we should be looking at raising the adequate resources to ensure eco economic recovery is really done justice to. Thank you. Great, thank you, Neelam. And just again, what would be your biggest ask at the moment to get you through the next month or two of what you're doing practically? Yeah, so I really think that uh, quick support on the National COVID Care Corps, uh, in which we are seeing a lot of interest because these professionals are then going to transition into livelihood professionals. Right, so it's, it's quite clear to us that health and livelihoods have to be the two sides of the same coin in India for many years to come. And uh, I believe there is a lot of potential there. And uh, this is a strong call out to any, anybody interested in the room to really come forward and support that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Neelam. We're gonna move on now to uh, the Vata Leap Coalition and uh, Ashraf Patel. Ashraf. Hi, thank you. Uh... Ron, can you uh, have the slide? And I animated it. I thought I was going to control it. So you, you'll have to click. Uh, when I say click, you'll have to click. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, really very special to be here uh, uh, and uh, just inviting you to join us in this mission that we are working on. We are calling Gen Nation Rebuilding. The idea is to build the nation, but also the idea is to build the generation. And the uh, uh, the focus is on nurturing a collaborative, what we are calling a collaborative leademic of youth response to COVID. So bringing young people and youth workers together. Who are we? We are Community the Youth Collective. It's a community of practice that has, uh, of youth workers and youth organizations that has been together for 10 years, doing a whole lot of other interventions, which I'll not go into here. Vartalip Coalition is a cross-sectoral group of organizations across different sectors and members from across different sectors, including uh, funding agencies, uh, UN agencies, uh, uh, issue-based organizations, not necessarily working on youth, but all interested in building a collaborative ecosystem for youth-centric development. Can we go to the next slide? And these together with Vartalip and Commutiny and Catalyst 2030, and we have many Catalyst members who are representative of this ecosystem in this collective. Uh, we are 175 member organizations and we share a youth-centric approach. We create common principles and practices to work together on youth leadership. Uh, we are working across uh, all diversities, intersectional groups and across regions. What are we aiming for on the, under the Gen Nation Rebuilding Initiative uh, with frontline youth workers? youth volunteers and young social entrepreneurs. This is our core who we focus in. We would want to, we have been there in the last wave. It's always, as we know, everyone here does. Uh, it's a time to salute young people and youth workers. They certainly have always been at the front line first to move and the fastest to move. And this is the group we want to, we have been focusing on, we want to focus on to respond now and continue to do uh, to the immediate crisis with relief, recovery, as well as co-creating a space for resilience, agency, and entrepreneurship. Uh, why? I think uh, uh, I'll just 
every can everyone can recognize that if we can all go back to when many of us uh, can go back to when we were young youth is a time for figuring and discovering who you want to be and where you want to go and this is probably the one time when across all diversities young people have a shared experience of loss and absence of uh, opportunity absence of education absence of spaces to meet hang out just that growing up experience that is so normal that is one thing the other thing is a sense of great uncertainty as to what the future holds being in a young person shoes today uh, is 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 something to see how difficult it must be and it is this why we feel is there is a need once again to strengthen young young people's leadership in resurrecting their own lives and those of their communities if they are engaged in community action which many of them are but many of them aren't how do we inspire more of this leadership to take unified action and strengthen personal and societal well-being we can go to the next that's the focus how we are doing it uh, building a common cause uh with 550 youth workers and leaders this is the seeding of the initiative under Ge uh, generation rebuilding we are having this collective is a collaborative is 175 organizations all doing their own thing wonderful organizations doing wonderful stuff goonj is here farm to food is here many other people are here i uh will not not be able to mention they are all doing wonderful work on the ground on their own independently but we come together independently to nurture the space for youth leadership and together in 21 states we want to build these 550 youth workers and leaders uh, uh the planned outreach is 100000 families and 1 million people through what initiatives uh, because at the core is covid relief yeah we can go to the next please click one yeah what are the young people and young leaders have been doing and doing and will need to do continue to do is relief measures which many of you have also mentioned i'm not going into details but uh, these this is around safety health uh, food rations and uh, also setting up infrastructure entrepreneurial initiatives in both rural and urban areas which has been totally amazing what kind of work has emerged uh, to respond to the crisis so so supporting that supporting those initiatives which young people want to lead will lead and nurturing more young leaders to join that uh, as well as awareness campaigns which we know vaccine hesitancy is a big thing coming up and uh, they are the best best motivators in the sense the best people to transform their own families and their communities uh, on things like this uh, and also breaking uh, fake news and breaking myths and breaking social norms that are emerging around covid and all the other things also related to covid not just health uh, i want to come so this is next please so one part is relief measures so this whole ecosystem is supporting the building of these youth workers youth leaderships nurturing strengthening uh, while the relief measures go on because they are needed there is also something around governance and supporting the phcs or supporting community efforts that are already existing the idea is not to set up parallel one so these young uh, leaders and youth workers also support ongoing initiatives in their communities the other important one i want to say is recovery measures this is a very big initiative that we are doing uh, this will be on well being and uh, uh, we 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 are developing toolkits and processes and ex, uh, campaigns on how uh, which young people uh, and youth workers will lead in their own communities and uh, uh the idea is to bring in get intergenerational dialogue going get a conversation on how what is happening how are we feeling and how do do these feeling dialogues to switch to well being to change the situation from despair to hope at least try to build that through positive actions to uh, to build from to move from apathy to ownership uh to really move those feelings so this is a togetherness table where we are talking about moving from hate to love despair to hope ownership to uh, apathy to ownership uh, uh, and moving that so this these are the, some of the things that we are going to do with the larger ecosystem uh, with the entire community the other is about spreading well being awareness that is narrative building that is around youth leadership that young people make the change they have the solutions they need to participate in leadership and in decision making we have to engage them now the solutions for what's going to happen and how are we going to shape this country how are we going to build back 
uh, will have to come from those conversations. So that's why we want the young leadership actions inside this collective and coalition, but also outside to be showcased. And so we are going to do uh, public initiatives and campaigns to bring out what are the young people's aspirations and solutions that they are presenting for building this nation and building this generation. Thank you so much. Looking forward to you joining us. Thank you, Ashraf. And just one quick question, you know, as, a, as a practical matter, you know, what, what, what are your priorities over the next month or two? What's your biggest uh, challenge? I think the biggest challenge right now for us is also to uh, supporting and strengthening the youth work ecosystems. People don't realize that uh, these youth workers and uh, youth uh, volunteers and youth leaders are emerging from ecosystems, from youth organizations that exist there. So the biggest challenge is supporting these youth work organizations and the youth workers and youth leaders. So biggest challenge is that and young social entrepreneurs, when they have a startup idea, when they have an initiative to respond to this situation, which they are doing, and they're just fantastic ideas I don't have the time to share, then I think supporting them in, in the form of fellowships and leadership is very, very critical. Leadership, uh, entrepreneurship, seed funding. Thank you very much. We're going to move last but not least to the hashtag back the frontline uh, collaborative, which is Deval. Deval, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, if we could get the slides, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Yvonne. We can just go to the second one. Perfect. Um, so we um, uh, are uh, decided, I guess, about six weeks ago when we saw how difficult it was for our own team members, uh, our NGO staff uh, that we support, uh, and families across uh, the country suffering and, and just the lack of support uh, that we needed to act quick and we needed to act fast. And, and that's when we said, why don't we do our best in, in sort of sending out an email to people that we know both in India as well as abroad uh, to try to raise some support for, for a, a few different initiatives that we saw were happening on the ground and leverage the 22 years of experience we have in, in, in supporting um, multiple organizations across the country uh, in this time of need. And, and that's why really our, our goal was threefold. Number one is um, raise $10 million to support a minimum 100 organizations across the country with unrestricted funding. Uh, we, we realize that uh, like you've heard from the partners today, every organization has a unique skill their communities uh, have different needs depending on where the pandemic is hitting them today. And uh, even something as simple as a geographic uh, focus or difference, what's happening in Gujarat is very different than what's happening in Jorissa, which is very different than what's happening in Delhi. So really that, that need for speed and flexibility was critical. And that's really where we said, why don't we create something that just gives money out the door as soon as possible and really trust the organizations that we've been, again, a very privileged to serve for, for many, many years now in India uh, to do whatever their community needs them to do. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and, and so just this gives you a sense of uh, the 50 um, grants we've already committed in making. And, and so not only have we been raising capital at the same time, but also dispersing it. Um, uh, like many of the presentations before, we've had a strong focus on vulnerable populations. This gives you a sense of the different communities that we're, we're operating in. And thus far, about 50% of the grants have been committed uh, in, in multiple states in India. Uh, the next tranches will be uh, sort of more northern India, eastern India, and, and, and southern India. Uh, but, but the goal is really to cover organizations across different communities and work with, in fact, many of the organizations and initiatives that have already been presented. Uh, ne next slide. Uh, this just gives you, again, a sense. Um, we've been lucky to, to, to be able to raise $7 million out of our $10 million target. Um, We've also started a campaign to raise local funding uh, to support non-FCRA organizations. And so for those of you who don't know, it is actually quite difficult to bring in foreign funding into the country, including at this time of need. Uh, and, and, and so we're creating sort of an Indian campaign to support those groups that don't have permission to bring in foreign funds. So they also get supported. Uh, these are typically the groups that are smaller in size that are in far flung areas across the country 
and again, just need access to capital, not only to support their communities, but unfortunately, many of them need also access to capital to even survive the next couple of months. Um, and, and so currently, that is really our goal. It's simple. It's trusting the organizations, giving them unrestricted funding up to $100,000 uh, or, or up to 25% of their budget, um, and really just enabling them to do whatever it takes to serve. Um, I think we've realized that, um, like Shiv and others have said, COVID is not just here for this wave. It will be here for the next couple of years at least. And, and so going forward, our goal is to raise sort of a, between a 50 to $100 million resilience fund and really look at uh, long-term development issues and, and focus on the inequalities that have existed in the country well before COVID came, came to our shores. Uh, but but uh, definitely this has provided a spotlight um, in helping us realize whether it's informal workers, vulnerable groups, uh, individuals from minority communities, or even like uh, Anchu from Gunj was saying, you know, the 60 leprosy colonies that we have in our country, and that's sad enough that we still have leprosy colonies. Uh, these are the kind of groups we're looking to support long term and to really fix some of the issues. I think uh, one of the big things that I think we're realizing, and I think in a global media perspective, I think we're already out of the news right now, uh, just because the crematoriums in Delhi are not as stacked as they were a few weeks ago, and, and those images don't exist anymore. But, but the issue really is that many of the groups that we serve, they've told us their community has slipped at least five to seven years back in terms of the development indicators that they've worked so hard to do. Um, and, and COVID is still here for the next few years in India. With less than 3% of our population fully vaccinated, this is going to go on for the next three years, if not longer, which means children will not be in school, which means artisans uh, and, and livelihoods are gonna suffer because they cannot even go to factories anymore due to safety. Um, and, and the psychosocial rehabilitation uh, that these communities need with many people losing you know, a couple of loved ones and including parents is, is just appalling. Um, and, and so really it's that long-term view and perspective, I think that we all need to sort of come together. And, and just like the Catalyst 2030 model, uh, we're very proud to, to be sort of uh, social entrepreneurs ourselves, raising money for social entrepreneurs and having social entrepreneurs decide where that money goes. And honestly, taking the power away from the donor who may even be in this country or in other countries, but are not as well vetted in what the community's needs are and are not able to take the risks that clearly our country needs uh, to be taken to help them through this crisis. Matthew? Thank you very much. And, and I suppose one question um, that hits me immediately is, you know, as, as someone who isn't there on the ground, you know, a number like $10 million or even 50 to $100 million I, it's hard to get a sense of how much of a difference that sort of amount of money would make to the organizations you're working with. You know, should it be 10 times as much, 100 times as much? Um, you know, what, 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 what is actually a, a capable of being achieved with that sort of amount of money? And what would be the sort of scale you could achieve with more money, I guess? Of course. And, and so in this emergency grant period, just to give anyone a sense, um, large, very large Indian foundations have given between 10 to 20 lakh of rupees uh, versus 75 lakhs that we're giving. Uh, and this includes the likes of Omidyar Network and others that are very well respected. So already we're giving three to four times the amount that larger funding agencies have been giving in India uh, on the relief efforts. Um, when it comes to funding, um, many uh, of our large funding agencies in the last few years have actually turned inward to be less of grant makers and more of implementers themselves, Matthew. And, and the issue with that is uh, we have such a rich uh, and diverse civil society, therefore that has suffered because grants have just been taken away from them. Uh, and as one of uh, the participants talked about earlier, uh, there have been about eight to 10 government regulations that have come in literally month by month since COVID hit, which is really starving the sector uh, for funding. Um, and, and so uh, 50 to $100 million, just you know, calculating basically given 10 to $20 million a year can support up to 50 organizations, some with small grants, some with large grants, but really enable them to grow in scale. And we've been fortunate to support industry, Swasti, Goonj, uh, and others that have presented today. And really the goal is that we needed to support many more of these since, since civil society has been under attack 
Um, and it's sad even in times like these when, when these organizations are literally risking their lives with 30 to 50% of their staff being infected uh, are not able just to get capital to do their work. And, and so that's really our goal is to have an Indian led fund to support multiple organizations to really decolonize uh, the giving that exists in the country and ensure that there's a greater giving culture in our country, not just foundations trying to implement their own programs. Great, thank you. So um, we're going to turn now to a broader Q&A discussion for the rest of the time that we have together. Um, and I would encourage anyone uh, who's following this uh, discussion who wants to ask a question just to put it in the chat uh, function and I will keep an eye on that. Otherwise, I will be asking questions. I did want to also highlight uh, a couple of things. One is that um, one of our big partners uh, in the Catalyst 2030 work has been the Schwab Foundation um, and Francois uh, Benici uh, did put a message in the chat about how committed they are to helping these collaborative efforts. And so please uh, do, do read that and, and respond to, to them directly if, you would, if you'd like to do that. Secondly, one, one initiative we have at Catalyst 2030 is the People's Report Card, which is picking up your point, uh, Deval, on you know, how far back has, has this crisis already pushed much of the development work that, um, that, 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 that has been underway for the past few years. And we're trying to get a real on the ground um, view of uh, you know, what's going on through a, a, through a very interactive um, survey that has been produced by the partners of Catalyst 2030. If anyone wants to know any more about that and how you could get that out to your organizations so we could have as many people contribute to that initiative as possible, that would be, uh, be great. And please reach out to Catalyst 2030 for more information about that. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, to take up Catherine Cheney from uh, DevEx's uh, question that's just come up in the chat, which is, um, you know, what are there efforts to go beyond philanthropy and use philanthropy to mobilize private financing and how could that be helpful in the longer term? Maybe I'll stick with you, Deval, to start and then maybe go to um, uh, to Shiv to after that. Actually, if you don't mind, I think Neelam would be uh, really good at answering this question because with industry and their work and livelihoods, uh, she's definitely looking at blending financing to, to help solve some of the issues. Afternoon, okay, well, Neil, and then, and then maybe Shiv. Yeah, I can also answer some of that. We did that last week. Yeah, Wonderful. thank you. So it's a question. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Neil, and then we'll go to Shiv and then Ved. Uh, no, we were just in a conversation with UNDP earlier, and there's a deep interest to be able to really look at different forms of capital. And I think pay for success is a good form. It's just that there are not enough... Um, players to manage it. And I think that's something UNDP is going to look at uh, to help some uh, structural improvements. But we are working on a PFS for now. And I think it's a great opportunity to use that. And also, if we can look at uh, all the di uh, 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 different kinds of debt instruments, interest subventions, guarantees to leverage more capital, I think that's going to be a, play a very, very key role in the future. Great. Uh, Shiv, did you have something on this? Yes, thank you. No, thanks, Catherine. I think it's a very important question. We should look at diversifying uh, you know, uh, capital, particularly what the requirement gap is going to be is massive, right? Uh, we were talking about SDG gaps, but we are talking about COVID financing gaps are massive, They're even incalculable in some sense. So what we've been doing is a couple of things. Uh, we are looking at innovative financing like post-paid relief. There are lots of NGOs on the ground who've gone and delivered relief. They have to do it now. They can't wait for writing a proposal and getting money, right? So we are launching a product called the Postpaid Relief, which companies are finding it easier to subscribe, uh, which is uh, again, uh, you know, checked out by independent auditors. And the second thing uh, we are doing is uh, when we are delivering vaccines in telecare to the vulnerable community, some of the corporations who sponsored it said, can you do this for our own staff? We said, well, we can do that. Can we charge a premium, right? So we are now uh, setting up a complete wing, which is delivering vaccines and telecare for COVID for corporations. And we are charging three times more transparently so that they can pay for two to three people from the vulnerable communities who can get the same service. So I think we need to look at new ways of uh, raising capital, Matthew. Great, and uh, Ved? 
Yeah, two initiatives I'll talk about is because you know that we are working with the small and marginal farmers across the country. So last year, uh, where for Kharif inputs, farmers wanted uh, some loans and we talked to Rangde. Rangde gave uh, almost 50 lakh rupees worth of, uh, 5.7 crore rupees worth of loans at 0% interest. So that is the kind of capital. It's a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, as many of you would know. And that is one way and to actually begin to finance. You know, this time also for Kharif, for this crop, people will need inputs, but we can't go on giving grants. Second thing I would mention is that impact development bonds. I was a member of the technical group of social stock exchange that has just concluded its recommendations. So uh, I can at another time tell you once the government uh, finance ministry notifies the social stock exchange, that is another way to meet capitalist friends with the, with the you know, people like us who are at the rural areas. So that's a very big thing that can happen in, under SEBI regulations. And there's some questions, some comments that Jacob Matthews has been making in the chat about uh, the need for working capital and particularly micro businesses and, and what the microfinance industry uh, needs and could, could, could do. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that, Ved? Can you just repeat the question, please? So, how, I mean, how do we get the working capital that so many of these organizations need at a micro level? So, uh, apart from the Rangde, uh, I run this program called Buddha Fellowship Program. And there are institutions like FWWB, Friends of Women's World Banking, that has been giving money to SHG federations. And they have also given money to farmer producer organizations. And working capital is a very, very important part. Last year also, they gave money to an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, he wanted to buy custard apple and process it and sell it as a frozen pulp. So those, uh, that, that, and Samunnati is another. So there are several uh, NBFCs and such other institutions that look at working capital and without necessarily, a, without a, uh, what do you call a, uh, you know, guarantee. So we can give a guarantee and we can get, get that kind of a support. So that is possible to do it. And NGOs can do the guarantee for FPOs as well as SG federations. Great, and now Parul Shet has had a hand up. So um, would you like to briefly talk about what you're doing uh, just for a minute? Yeah, so uh, we are working uh, with children uh, with the child rights based approach. And we are trying to uh, collaborate with other organization. And one of the biggest network is Child and India Foundation. Uh, so we are trying to bring together and uh, right from the grassroots level uh, with the most marginalized children in rural tribal areas, slums, and in the larger network. We also need to do a lot of advocacy around it. So we are trying to do this. We are still in a little bit initial phase. Uh, Jiru is supporting us. Uh, I have written to Dasra and others. Uh, I might uh, also try to reach out to Siv and others. Uh, uh, so we need this kind of support to, because children consist 40% of India's population. And we need to ensure the, their education, uh, their health and nutrition, and their protection through their active engagement and participation. We also need a lot of uh, resource materials to train the facilitators to work with children as well as for the children. So we need a lot of support from many, not all of, in terms of funding and other resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously that's a hugely important area to focus on children. And um, I wanted to ask a, a question uh, to, to, to Neelam, but also probably to, to Shailab and, and Anshu. Um, you know, what, uh, Neelam, you mentioned 20% of the population of the most vulnerable people that, that you feel your collaboration is, is really addressing. Um, you know, as we look at all these different uh, collaborative efforts, you know, where, uh, how, how, what's the sort of percentage that in aggregate we feel are, are being usefully addressed and, and what do we do to bring the rest of the population in? And how do we Matthew. Even further. 20% yeah. I'm talking about is an aggregation of all the all the all the collaboratives in the room here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, including so how do we get, how do we get the rest of how, how do we get the, the other 80%? Social entrepreneurs. So what do you think? How, what, what, what needs oh, to yes. happen to get more? 
I, I have a feeling this is your quintessential, quintessential 80 20 problem. You get this 20%, and there will be such a radical spread of all the methodologies that have been used. You know, so this is going to be the tipping point. I firmly believe in this. Any solutions, because you always have a tipping point, right? So if you can crack this 20%, and if you can build models and you can build disruptive platforms, which people can access independently, right? If you scale telehealth or you scale tele livelihood advisory or you scale the NCC core, it, it can spread like wildfire. So there's a certain minimum scale of ignition after which I think things have to start happening on their own. Matthew, that's my strategy on this. Right, Shayla or uh, uh, Anshu, do you want to comment on this? Uh, Anshu? Yeah. So, you know, my my fear is, to be honest, a little bit different. Uh, I am generally thinking that uh, have we, people like us, have we really, really accepted that there is something wrong which happened in the last few decades or years? Are we making the same mistakes again? Do we still think that by creating roti.com, you can get roti? I mean, my, my problem is that, and you know, when I become a part of many of these consultations, I again see that maybe we are again moving in the same big size, giant solutions, and we are still not making the people who are affected by our decisions, our stakeholder. Many of us are still not going to the communities and asking, rather we are going with the solutions and then trying to see that who buys it. And I am I am saying it in a very blanket way, because this is this is my feel when I when I see these big figures, big pictures, and and many of us are still not accepting that a lot of it is completely completely failed. All the all the big projects, big projection of the next twenty years, thirty years, every single thing failed. All the big airports, airlines, everything failed. But do we have the humility in this group, at least, to accept? that it is the time when we think in a different direction. We take a pause, but we talk to people much more than what do they need. I feel that virus, especially in, in an Indian context, virus has actually given us a beautiful chance to give more power to youth, to listen more to the village communities, value them much more, and see that how do we really take care of them at their you know, part and also value their wisdom a lot. I mean, the, the, my, my problem is that still we think that we have a lot of skill and we have everything because we are sitting in our own rooms and making programs on our laptops largely. We are still not calculating the amount of wisdom which is available in the community. And the fact remains that in the second wave, because it became a huge health crisis, it was impossible for the villages to maintain certain things because it was a huge crisis of health. But if you see the first wave in India, villages or the small communities were much better managed by themselves instead of outside intervention. So are we learning from Dharavi in Mumbai and the people of Dharavi in Mumbai how to control COVID spread? I think that's my thing. And if we open up for the larger community, uh, I think we will be able to involve much larger groups, much larger number of people in finding solutions so that we don't impose on them, right? We are talking about numbers here. And I'm saying that we need to involve more people from the grassroots, not from our community only. You know, it's not just the social entrepreneurs who can solve the problem. Maybe the grassroots movements can solve the problem in a much better way, in a much lesser cost. Let's be honest about it. Thank you. But hopefully this, uh, one, of, one of the things that this Catalyst 2030 uh, Collaborative is able to do is to connect the grassroots better with the, with the top, so the top down, right. bottom up. Um, Kumar, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, whenever scale is talked about, um, it's always in large numbers. And, you know, I, I come from a background where people run their own health insurance. So 
you know, always being asked about, you know, can you scale this up? Can you scale this up? The thing is uh, a decentralized model where communities can be part of the solution rather than, you know, being fed as, as Anshu was talking about. I think uh, we have yet not decided whether, you know, this startup wave of scaling up is the right model for uh, the development sector as well. Everybody, every donor right now wants to scale it up. Uh, scale what? You cannot scale local solutions like that, you know? And I think uh, if we really want to take this forward, even in the telehealth model, we are trying to create local volunteers who will connect, you know? And every problem is different from the other. So we have to have those kind of solutions. And I think, uh, if you are not decentralizing, any kind of amplification will not work in the long run. Thank you. Well, I want to, we're almost out of time. I want to give um, a, a last word from our speakers to, um, to Ashraf, really, to give us a sense of what the, you know, a, a voice of hope from the next generation. What, what, do you, what do you feel like the young people that you're engaging with you know, most want to achieve out of this? I mean, what is, or what, how serious do you think the commitment is to build back better? And then I'm going to ask actually Jeru very briefly to say something, which I know she didn't want me to do, but I'm going to do anyway. Um, please, Ashraf. Ashraf? It's a public forum. I can make a con confession. Neelam said I'm this youngest person or something. I've just got colored hair. That's all I can start with, I have to tell you. But yeah, I have been working with young people and youth workers and in the youth work system for a long time. And uh, for me, I, I do resonate a lot with what Anshu said. I think the uh, solutions and the, the, the yeah, why the, there is hope. Uh, why? Because uh, it's just like that. It, it's that uh, what every generation has to figure their solutions, one, number one. The other thing is young people have been at the, you know, uh, it's a patriarchal and a hierarchical system. So young people do not have the space to either assert themselves or create new social norms. And while we are talking about health, we are talking about livelihood, there will be other social norms that come in the way of even that being accessed. And I, for me, that is a very important thing and a very hopeful thing that young people, if engaged with, uh, and if they have spaces, whether it's in their families or in schools or in communities, if they have opportunities to experience cross-border relationships, uh, in deep engagement with social action and a deep reflective space. If we can do that wherever, and it doesn't need money, it needs, well, it needs people, it needs good facilitators, which also may, yes, needs resources, but it needs us. And that for me has always been a sign of hope because that's where young people then emerge as leaders and they actually break. I think right now we do need to change that. We need to change social norms in every way. And part of what conversation Anshu is making is, also that, and we talk about scale, sorry, because you said, we're talking about scale. The conversation, what I feel for me, hope is scale, what we use the word scale with soul, which means that every young person is important. And of course, every person is important. So not looking at young people or youth as a number, but that each person, each individual, each community, each needs deep engagement, investment for truly living, uh, thriving lives and to lead and to lead that is the most important participation and decision making can we create that space in the country that there is a voice and the voice is heard and that would create equality justice fraternity and freedom thank you thank you very much well i mean i i've been sort of struck by the tremendous uh, examples we've heard this morning of collaboration um and of of, of you know a really serious collective response to the challenges that are hitting the country at the moment. I wanted to just end by asking Jeru, um, who really is the driving force behind the creation of Catalyst 2030. I mean, Jeru, this seems like very much the sort of collaborative work that, that, you, that you, know, you hoped would come out of the Catalyst 2030 initiative. I wonder what you might feel you want to say to everyone involved in these collaborations and also what your hope is for this collaborative effort going forward in India? 
Mm -hmm. I was I am on the India WhatsApp group as an observer, and I think the Indian entrepreneurs truly inspire me. And what's lovely is to see that there is so much sharing going on on the day-to-day -day level as they distribute food packets and share vehicles or raise things or PPEs. So there's a lot of small day-to-day -day collaboration. And in addition to that, they, they have built these collaboratives. So for me, if there's one thing that has come as a real positive from COVID, it's the extent and the breadth of collaboration that is taking place across the Catalyst Network in India and everybody. I remain inspired, I listen, and for me, that is really what it is, you know. And if I can say something about youth, you know, I, it's my passion. <laughs> One of the things we've been doing is actually a lot of, I work with street youth, and last night I was with one of my old street boys, who's now 40, and he's a shoeshine boy, and he started a whole shoeshine movement. So the old young youth of all the street shoeshine boys are also starting movements and they have learned from the entrepreneurs and the communities to mm -hmm. sort of advocate for the change they want to see. So I think collaboration is at all levels happening and COVID is spurring that. It, so that's one positive out of all of this. That's how I look at it. And well, thank you. Well, thank thanks you. for ending on a positive note. I would just again encourage everyone uh, to... Um, reach out to us about the report cards. I think it's very important that we get as much data from the ground up about what's really going on um, and the organizations can help deliver that. Um, and that this recording will be available for anyone that wants to, 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 to share this with other people. Um, and there's obviously a sort of urgent need for resources, for partnership with government that's more effective. And, and to bring more organizations into, into these collaborations. And let's hope that Neelam is right and that this is the tipping point that is needed. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for the work they're doing, um, for the speakers this morning, for, for, for or my morning, your, your evening, for, um, for sharing what you're doing uh, with us and for everyone that joined us this morning, this evening. Um, thank you for, for, for being with us. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you.